Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Science of SaaS Startup podcast. Today, I'm talking to Peter Fishman. Peter is the co-founder and CEO of Mozart Data. They are a, a one-stop shop for setting up and optimizing a modern data platform. Peter, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So I just want to kick things off by asking a, a couple of questions just to help the audience get to know you a little bit. So first off, what, what is the best professional development book that you've read? Well, so generally my favorite business book is not so much a business book, but it is uh, Moneyball. So Moneyball okay. actually sort of inspired my own career, but it actually has also inspired a lot of my thinking all throughout my career when it comes to hiring, when it comes to management. Um, and the theme of Moneyball is really about identifying undervalued uh, talent. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big baseball fan. The Oakland A's, uh, I was living um, actually in Oakland at the time. Uh, and the Oakland A's uh, had figured out sort of a system for identifying undervalued players. And Michael Lewis wrote a great story um, about it. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that story. I, I'm a big football fan and people are obsessed with Moneyball over here as well. And I think football is a lot more complicated to apply some of those ideas to, to football. But obviously it was so successful in baseball that everybody tried, like nonetheless. Well, so one one quick point on that. So I actually started my my own career uh, in, in the in the NFL in sort of our, in our version of football uh, and uh, not as a player, but as a statistician. And um, what's interesting is just like uh, just like with your version of football, I would say that one of the challenges uh, that you don't have as much in base uh, in baseball is that many players are interacting simultaneously and it's harder to identify what each person's contribution is because it's so much a team sport. Whereas in baseball, many of the interactions are one off pitcher versus batter. Um, and uh, that that provides, in some sense, a little bit less of an opportunity because the data is noisier and tougher to interpret, but it also provides a lot more of an opportunity because it's a lot harder to do novel things. So on, so it's sort of uh, when, when, when I see sort of Moneyball expanding into other sports, it sort of has this, this component of actually being, you know, now is a super interesting time to attack these problems in other sports. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely fascinating. I mean, you probably won't know, but there's a, a football team in the UK called Brentford who's really taken a lot of this to heart. And they're, they're a kind of tiny, they're based in London, but they're a tiny club and they've done better and better year on year. And they um, they got promoted to the Premier League last year, which is an incredible achievement. And it's really down to the kind of the data-driven approach which they've taken to running the team. So. Sadly, my experience with the promotion and relegation uh, just come from uh, the Netflix and Amazon shows that that follow the clubs that are trying to yeah, yeah. get it down. Okay, so the, the second question is: what what skill have you let yet to learn, which is uh, remains on your bucket list? Um, well, so there are many there are many skills that I <laughs> that I lack. Um, so there are there are technical skills, there are uh, managerial skills. Um, there are sort of just general life skills around organization. Um, obviously, organization and, and discipline around it is something that I sort of uh, wish and aspire to, but I don't so much um, I, I don't so much put on my bucket list. It's the type of thing where I'd love to get better at it. There are tools for getting better at it, but I never do. I think most of the most of the skills that I'd love to learn and grow at, tend to be um, managerial. So, you know, when I was at Yammer and then Microsoft, I grew from being a line manager into being a manager of managers, which has a variety of different challenges and, and, and skills associated. It's often, um, and then as you're a, as you're a, you know, a director or a, a manager of managers, you end up having to also do a lot of managing sort of um, diagonally. You have to manage down without, authority. And um, that's a real skill. And I think like that's something that I'm, I'm constantly hoping to get better at. And as I you know, now play the role of CEO, now I have basically authority. Um, but there's a lot of sort of what I would think of as diagonal management. So management through some of my lieutenants that are actually the ones that are, you know, capable of understanding 
the problems that you know the IC is facing. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just to to kind of finish off on this one. So, if you could compete in any Olympic sport, obviously we've got the Olympics going on at the moment. Which would you choose? Well, in some sense, everybody wants to be able to compete in the decathlon, but I like to actually be excellent at one sub discipline. So, you know, I think of like uh, you know Mozart as running the hundred meter dash over and over and over and over and over again. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, the, the joke is that, you know, uh, on some level it, it's a marathon in practice, it just feels like a bunch of sprints, uh, strung together. So if I had to, if I had to say my one Olympic sport, I'd love it to be the, the hundred yard dash. Yeah. I think, I think I'd have to divide my hundred yard time by two in order to be, <laughs> uh, competitive, but that would yeah, be my, uh, my aspiration. Okay, so if we jump into to Mozart Data, do you want to kick things off just giving us an overview of the company and, and what you're trying to do at the moment? Sure. So Mozart is the easiest way to spin up a modern data stack. And what that means in practice is that we manage your extract and load, we manage a data warehouse for you, and we manage a layer for you to clean your data or do transformations. Um, and then you can get this all up and running in under an hour without needing any data engineers. You then connect your BI tool and then you're automating reports and dashboards and insights. And um, it's really incredible. Uh, the reason that I say that is because I've built the stack, you know, half a dozen times. Um, and this used to require hiring a bunch of data engineers, buying a bunch of expensive technology upfront, not in, not in a metered way. Um, today, really, the speed at which you can uh, have a world-class data stack without needing a ton of technical expertise just to get there, um, it's incredible. Um, it really you know, makes me want to go back in time and uh, save all the companies that I've worked for uh, lots and lots of money. I mean, it used to be that you would hire someone like me um, and then you know, weeks at best more accurately months later after evaluating some tools and technologies, you'd have a stack in place. Um, today, we think the winners of the modern data stack have clearly emerged and we wanna get you running with those um, incredibly quickly, incredibly cost-effectively and without any data engineers. So the, the modern kind of company is, is in like an explosion in the number of different number of SaaS tools which they're using these days. And, and obviously they've got data coming at them from like hundreds of different sources. What, what, is, what does it look like inside a company that isn't using a solution like yours at the moment? Like how, how do they get a handle on all those different sources of data? Sure, so um, the number one competitor to Mozart data is doing nothing. So most companies uh, do nothing. They want to be data-driven, they aspire to be data-driven in the same way that I aspire to be organized or I aspire to use my workout apps. Most companies end up doing nothing. Um, but many of them want to use the data and it's becoming more and more table stakes that companies that are competing in the modern environment are using data. Now they're getting tons of signals from their SaaS tools, right? So they're, they're, they're getting data that flows into their databases, into their SaaS tools. Um, and those often are analyzable in a silo, right? So if I want to understand things about, um, you know, let's say I'm a D2C company and I use Shopify. If I want to understand things uh, about what's going on um, in Shopify, Shopify has a variety of data I can export to CSV. I can look at charts within the tool. Same with Salesforce if you're a B2B company but often you get your big power by combining these data sources together. And as you mentioned, now almost every modern company is using maybe not hundreds, but they're using a handful uh, at the core of what they're doing. And that's critical to their business. So it's not uh, like uh, an uncommon use case where you have to combine your product data from your database with you know, maybe your CRM data. You might have to combine your Stripe data and your Square data. You might have to, you know, it's it's, a lot of the power of, of the data is it being complete and being joinable across these tools. So there are a couple of ways to get there. The first is um, actually like hiring the data engineer. So talented data engineers, while expensive, 
do things like combine the data in smart ways um, and make it accessible to the entire to the entire company to use um, in a clean, reliable, trusted manner. Um, so hiring a data engineer that 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 writes uh, extract and loads into a data warehouse sets up a data warehouse is certainly a solution that many people use. Um, otherwise, people tend to use sort of piecemeal solutions. They say, okay, I really know that I need a powerful column. So they call up Amazon or Google or Snowflake. They might say, hey, I, I really need a great BI tool. And they'll call up a mode, a looker, a tableau. I think they know kind of where to get started, um, but it's really about bringing all of these pieces together um, because often you know, something will be missing and you really want to accelerate the people that are working with the data. And, and how, how do you overcome those challenges? So you know, if, if the other way of doing it is doing some serious programming and a lot of manpower with these data engineers, like how are you overcoming that challenge? Well, I mean, our, our goal isn't to completely uh, like obsolete like every every single data engineer. I mean, that's that's. Uh, but I do think that for many companies, um, especially at the smaller stages, um, before they've you know hired their first data engineer, they realize, boy, this is a really challenging role to hire for. I don't know exactly what I'm looking for. I have some engineering chops throughout the company. Uh, but you know, hiring you know a, a world class data engineer is is really challenging. Um, the typical you know it's you know when when the objection is well why don't we just do this ourselves? Most of that work is pretty rote and repetitive. So you know most companies should not reinvent the wheel on how to get data from Salesforce to Snowflake. Um, that's a pretty nicely solved problem, and paying an engineer to solve that problem again. It's kind of silly in the same way that you wouldn't like pay an engineer how to like search the internet. You know, you would rely on Google yeah. or Bing, my 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 former employer. So <laughs> I would say that um, I would say that you know I think a lot of companies do have this tension of wanting to own their stack, but you know you, we're seeing this sort of general sort of cloud revolution where. Um, where there's just a, a much greater trust of essentially the, the ecosystem all working together, right? So people don't say, geez, I wish I had a room with a ton of servers in it. They, they call up you know, Microsoft and Google and, and Amazon and say, okay, uh, you know, how, how do we get going? And, and I think the, and, and you know, we want that same trust to be there in the data space that there is um, more broadly in cloud. And is it um, is Mozart a self service solution, or do you need like some kind of technical background to use it? Yeah, um, the answer is uh, we 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 like to think of our solution as being able to be used by anybody that just knows SQL. So we want business users to be able to use our solution. You don't have to be um, a data engineer. You don't have to be particularly technical. Um, we basically intend for the business users that understand the business definitions uh, to be able to use our tool and our product. Um, it is self-service, um, but we also do like to do um, what, you know, I think Superhuman does this best, which is um, when I signed up for Superhuman, it's not like, I, you know, I'd been using email clients for, for over 20 years, but, um, you know, I had a, a 30 minute tutorial on how to use, you know, um, their service. And I think like that push in the back is really critical, especially when it comes to data, because the biggest problem is you just get stalled and you need to essentially just have somebody give you a little push in the back. So if you want to just start using Mozart data, there's a free 14 day trial. You just get started. Um, you can uh, sign up uh, on the website and you're up and running and you have a world-class modern data stack just with just by having an email address. If you want to really become effective with your data, um, we love to give you a little push in the back, maybe a 30 minute uh, helper session to get started. Uh, but for the most part, uh, even non-technicals can get started uh, using Mozart data in under an hour. Right. And, and do you see a sweet spot for, for Mozart data? I mean, is this a solution for any type of company or do you see a certain industry, a certain size of companies that, that are kind of going to be the ideal target for you? Sure. I mean, we largely target the SMB. Um, we're trying to um, push off 
for many, many years, your first data engineer hire. So companies that have an existing stack and infrastructure often, you know, have a lot of like legacy. Um, but I would say that uh, companies that are, you know, transitioning from they query their database, you know, uh, you know, it's which is a bad practice, or they're, uh, you know, they know that they really want to, you know, get, um, you know, really powerful data warehouse in place. Um, that is a great time um, for companies to talk with us. Now, what that means in practice, and we serve companies that are, you know, two people that were in my Y Combinator class, all the way up to uh, multiple unicorns where my cell phone is their, uh, is their support line. So I think, um, I think, you know, the, the answer is, I think people often try to say, well, what's your ICP? Is it of this size or is it in this industry? You know, size and industry are not really the, the dimensions for our ICP. It's right as they're approaching the start line on a really big data journey. Now they may have done, you know, again, some siloed analysis in the past, or they might be querying, um, you know, their, their, their production database, or they might, you know, have, you know, some, some CSVs that they're using in G sheets or Excel uh, to sort of understand where their business is going. But as you're going to transition into using a BI tool, into using data, into answering ad hoc questions with, with SQL, um, uh, with your, with your data, you know, being combined together, that is a perfect time to start talking to us. And for some companies that's right when they get started, they know that they're data driven from the start. And for some companies, they end up being a series B, series C, series D type company before that's a reality. So it really depends. Yeah, okay. So if we just jump into to talking about the startup life a little bit. So you've um, raised just over $4 million so far through a, a couple of seed funds. And you've done startups that you mentioned previously and also spent some time in, in big corporate companies like Microsoft. I, I was just interested, like, what, what do you think is the, the biggest lesson you can take from a company like Microsoft into a startup? So, I mean, Microsoft, you know, I, I think has uh, basically like, you know, 40 years of experience in terms of like how to run, uh, you know, an engineering culture, right? And I think that that has been refined over time and there's sort of the ability to really um, get people started on early stages of their career without a ton of sort of professional maturity and grow them into you know highly capable senior engineers that can be you know uh, that can apply themselves at small companies big companies enterprises whatever their own company uh, etc so I think Microsoft, um, has a lot of um, kind of what I would call refined over time practices, which are like core to a mature company. So things like levels and peer review and uh, 360 review and um, and the way that you know you do um, you know compensation. All of that is really you know something that you see a mature company having. Now we're a startup. There are no levels. There are practically no titles. Um, and, uh, you know, we're sort of at the exact opposite of end, end of the spectrum, right? So working at a two-person co two company and a 200,000-person company is obviously wildly different. We've sort of jumped uh, one zero. We're now a 20-person company. Um, and, you know, obviously I have a few zeros to go before I catch <laughs> yeah. up uh, to, to Microsoft. But I think, like, what you see in that sort of progression you know, I mean, that's, you know, in that first 10x is, um, is sort of a desire to put some structure in place. And what's really nice to know is that's the end state. You know, the end state looks like uh, a variety of best practices um, in terms of, you know, managing a technical organization. Um, and the question is, like, how do you sort of keep the early nimbleness, the early speed, the early, like, passion? Um, and also like uh, get it to a place of, well, we know eventually we'll have this professional maturity in terms of um, in terms of sort of organizational structure that will make sense to very senior leaders, you know, both you know, growing our existing team into very senior leaders and then also hiring very senior leaders. And and when you're 
in that CEO role and you're in a startup and you're calling all of the shots, what was the, the kind of biggest freedom? Like, what, what do you think? Yes, now I can do this. And I never, I was never able to, for whatever reason, in a bigger company. Sure. I mean, uh, certainly there are cliches like, uh, you know, actually, like, I never felt more free than when I had like, you know, 20 skip bosses on, th- on top of me. But I would say that, um, I, you know, I, there, there was a line I always remembered. I, I used to make uh, $14,000 a year as a, as a graduate student living in the Bay Area. And my advisor said, you're never going to be so wealthy. And uh, the joke about that was that, like, it's true, like, you have no responsibilities in life. So, you know, having more, essentially, agency does not necessarily mean you have that many more freedoms. Now I have <laughs> yeah. a variety, I have a variety of bosses. Um, they just happen to be my customers. So, yeah. um, so I, I would say that there is, you know, when it comes to running the company, there's certainly a ton of agency that I have, but that's all about establishing the culture. So I get to establish what I think of as um, what I want the Mozart culture to look like, but ultimately that gets usurped by the company shortly after, you know, we grow. So, you know, there were core values to what we do. We have a few, I, I went to my, I did my undergraduate at uh, Duke University. So a lot of the core, and Duke is very famous because they have a really great college basketball team. And um, a lot of the core values literally come out of Duke basketball. So uh, there's a there's a player on, on Duke uh, called uh, Kyle, there, he used to play for Duke, called Kyle Singler. And Kyle Singler played every single position on the court. And they asked the coach, Coach K, you know, what position does does he play? And he says he played the position winner. And so one of our company core values, we call it Kyle Singler. And uh, what that means is basically everybody's expected to play the role of winner. So now that I have the sort of agency to run my, my own company, um, I, I wanted to uh, like sort of implement a lot of the values from my personal life into the initial company culture. But as you know, we've hired and as we've brought in people, great people, um, they shape the culture. So you lose that control of it, I think, rather rapidly. While it's still true on like the wall, we list our, our company core values and, you know, Kyle Singler will be there. Um, it, it's the case that it really evolves into what those terms mean and then how they impact how everybody does their work. And, and you started the company in April 2020, obviously just coming into that, that kind of first wave of, of COVID at that time. I mean, do you want to talk through how, how that happened? I mean, did you have any sure. second thoughts when, when you saw a big pandemic coming? I mean, what, what was the setup there? So, um, so first of all, I had, I had known my co-founder for over 20 years. Uh, we had been friends uh, for a long time, and each of us had individually had a, a, a lengthy career in the data space. So it was a no-brainer uh, uh, for us to get together and, and work together and collaborate. We were excited uh, to do that. Now, uh, the pandemic, of course, made it a lot more challenging, but also a lot easier. So first, it restricts your set of people that you can work with. So very often, there's this sort of, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's also, it's, it's often called like, um, you know, sort of choice, choice issues that when you have too many choices, you end up sort of not making one. Um, with the pandemic, there were only a handful of people where I had this type of rapport and working relationship that, you know, we could shortcut a lot of the, the sort of subtle beats that are missing when you're not in person. In fact, Dan and I actually didn't work together in the same room on Mozart for over a year after we started. Yeah. So, um, so that, that's crazy. So nobody at Mozart worked in the same room for over a year. Um, and that was, uh, you know, obviously, you know, something that many companies face, but you know, starting in a pandemic, certainly not ideal, but it did a, a couple of things. One, um, it did allow me to be incredibly focused. I think like, you know, the pandemic, uh, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a tremendous tragedy for the world, but, um, it had, uh, you know, some, some small positive externalities, uh, for me professionally in that I was able to be incredibly hyper-focused on the work and understand what was really important for building a team um, because 
um, because your choices were so narrowed and shrunk. I ended up, you know, I think of the first uh, 15 employees at Mozart, 12 of them I had worked with in the past. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, I think that there's a ton of disadvantage to it. And again, it's, uh, you know, an incredible world tragedy, but um, it also served as really sort of a forcing function into helping us make the decisions that we would need to make. And often you have some analysis paralysis when you're starting a company. The hardest mm -hmm. step is the first step. And, uh, you know, I, again, ideally, we could have had the same outcome and same start not being in a pandemic, uh, but we were able to do it during the pandemic. And it also made a lot of the fundraising conversations a lot easier. They all happened by Zoom. I didn't have to, you know, sort of, I guess, put on a suit or whatever the equivalent would be and, you know, go up and down Sand Hill Road. I was able to do a lot of this uh, essentially via uh, Zoom conversations and, and get investors from all over the world. So, um, so a ton of sort of subtle advantages to getting started uh, during a pandemic, though, of course, um, I'm very much looking forward to um, working together in an office. Yeah, I mean, I think like, like I, I do a, a regular daily post every day on like the different investments in the software industry. And over the 12 months, like the previous 12 months, we, we've seen like the scale of investment in the software industry just going up and up. And I was reading something by um, Paul Graham the other day where he was talking about like the war for talent being the, the number one conversation in boardrooms right now. And as you start to grow and start to hire new people that you don't necessarily know, and obviously comp is just kind of going off the scale, like wh where do you see that you can kind of compete beyond money? Like wh what's the kind of message that you can give new people joining the company? So. Um... The war for talent is inevitable. So it, it, it's all a trickle down of, um, you know, very low interest rates have led to incredibly large valuations and incredibly large valuations imply incredibly high multiples on essentially traction and signals of traction and revenue. And when that's the case, entrepreneurs are willing to spend, you know, real dollars towards getting any of those things hints of traction revenue new customers customer testimonials all of that you know essentially pays out in the end so if that's the case you're willing to pay for it up front so it's not surprising at all to me and i've certainly encountered it and seen it um, in sort of our own journey in terms of trying to hire um, great talent um it, it, it and it should be that way by the way it's 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 all about you know sort of the Reset super high valuations of these tech companies reflect that the earlier valuations allowed for, uh, you know, essentially incredibly high returns. Um, the the sort of increase of salaries of those like technically capable that are creating that traction that are adding that value that's just essentially recognizing well there's like more you know uh, value in terms of what they're doing and they should be able to essentially share and own a big chunk of that pie. So the, the fact that there's a talent war, the fact that like, um, you know, salaries are skyrocketing, this is just in some sense, part of the game. It's all part of the ecosystem and, and one thing affects the other. Um, how do you stand out in general? It, like one, obviously the standard dimension is, is money. And, and often when I worked at larger enterprises, um, that was a, a big uh, positive um, in terms of things that they tend to be able to offer. Generally, startups offer uh, two things. One, um, you know, obviously ownership. So you have big equity stakes in the startup relative to the enterprise. Um, so that if you believe very much in yourself and in the rest of the people around you, what you see is this incredible uh, opportunity for not just compensation growth, but actually professional growth. So, you know, my biggest uh, professional uh, gains were not necessarily, you know, when I had big monetary wins. It was actually when I was able to advance in level and advance in scope and capability such that my next job would, you know, you know, essentially reward me um, because of the skills that I had grown into and developed. So often, you know, I advise, you know, uh, friends, not so much people that are necessarily work, looking to work at Mozart or, or other places, but if you can be at a company that's looking to double its headcount, I don't care whether that company is 200,000 people or two people, 
Um, that's kind of a great signal that there's going to be increasing responsibilities for people that are at that company. And when you can basically grow your scope um, and also like fail, you know, have a have an organization that's willing to let you fail at something. You know, I think it's often hard, you know, I and you know, when I started uh, Mozart, it was myself and, and my co-founder, Dan, and, and, and one engineer. So I got to be the marketing team. I effectively, you know, I was our CEO, but I was also effectively our CMO. And, um, you know, I, no company in their right mind would hire me as their CMO, except for one, uh, Mozart. And, um, uh, and I think like essentially growing into roles that you're uncomfortable with or don't necessarily have the direct skill set for, but seeing how your own skill set can apply into that role uh, is, is a real essentially value of startups. Of course, we do a variety of the things. We try to have like, you know, I think best modern practices around flexible uh, work environment, um, sort of uh, being great about, uh, you know, being competitive uh, with equity and, and salary compensations. But at the end of the day, you've really got to deliver a mission that people believe in. Yeah, that's the thing, because equity obviously is only only going to be useful for a candidate coming in if they kind of believe in your vision for the company and can kind of see where it can take them in kind of three, four, five years' time. So, Well, it's been really great having you on, uh, Peter. Thank you for, for joining us today. If people want to get in touch and discuss Mozart Data, is kind of website best or LinkedIn, email? What, what's the best way to reach you? All of the above. So you can visit us at mozartdata.com. I'm Pete at MozartData.com. Um, also, don't hesitate to reach out on LinkedIn. Perfect. Okay, well, I really appreciate your time and look forward to seeing where the company goes you know, over the next couple of years. Thanks so much.